joy is ours. Thank you to Jesus. We can have joy in the face of whatever we're facing. You know, open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. We'll be reading there in a moment. On January 10th, 2003, a young man named Terry Dreyer was in the water um, for 20 hours after, after his boat capsized. He gave a valiant effort at survival, although afterwards he confessed that he felt certain that he was going to die. After a long while, a helicopter located him, and then came along a ship that was named the USS Comforter. This vessel was on its way somewhere else and paused to deliver one man from his peril. They went out of their way to save one man, and there was a doctor on board who nursed him back to health. Many people today are in the sea of affliction. They don't know how much longer they can hang in there. People are tired. They feel like all is lost. All we must do is look up and see that our deliverer, our comforter, is nearby. The God of all comfort will make sure that the comfort we need comes our way. So let's read our text. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-11, through 11, it says, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, and with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we abundantly in Christ's suffering, as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so though, so through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we are so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received a sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivers us from such deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted, granted us through the prayers of many. Let's pray, church. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place, God, for the message that you have prepared for the people here, God, that you would minister to them by your Holy Spirit, God, that it would be your Spirit, God, that touches people that touches the hearts and the minds of the people in this place, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So first I want to talk about the coup in our hearts. So affliction is something that we will all experience at some points in our lives. Most of us, if we have been born, have experienced afflictions. This is a part of life. Job 5, 6 through 7 says, for affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground, but man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. The word affliction means trouble and sorrow. Because the ways of the world, we are born into affliction. Affliction is just a part of our life. And many times people get mad at God because of the afflictions they experience. You know, they, something goes wrong and they shake their fist at God. And this isn't the way it should be. Ruth, um, Ruth 121 speaks of Naomi. And you guys know the story, Naomi and her family. They lived in a town and they left the town. And they, Naomi experienced great loss. Her husband and her sons both died. And she blames God for this. We see this in, in Ruth 1, uh, 1, verse 21, when they return to their home. She says, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? 
And if you know the story, you know that they picked up and left, not because God told them to, but because they were seeking comfort. So ultimately, this affliction was brought on by their disobedience to God's will. But yet she puts the blame on God. This is the wrong perspective to have towards God. It doesn't line up with God's character. And it doesn't align up with what God wants for us. However, God will allow affliction in our lives to build character. God does not afflict or grieve a person willingly, but when we come to affliction in our lives brought upon ourselves, brought upon the enemy, God will allow us to spend time in that affliction to turn us into the people he desires us to be. Lamentations 3 verse 33, For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men, his allowance of affliction is for the furthering of a person's destiny. Well, I was actually just talking about this a little bit with Zach and Bianca the other day. I've, I've been through things in my life. I've made mistakes in my life that I look back on and I'm like, man, that was stupid. But honestly, I'm glad for it because I learned from it. Did I sin in those moments? Yes. Did God want me to sin in those moments? No. But I did it. And God taught me something from it. And it turned me into the man that I am today. God will allow us to go through these afflictions to teach us something, to show us something, to show us his character. And in our life, oftentimes there are three sources where we, where we will experience affliction from. The first one is decisions in life will bring affliction. So the wills of people clashing will create a problem. People operating outside of God's wills and within their own will. You know, when you want something and somebody else wants something different, that is the clashing of people's wills. You will encounter people who just simply want to see you fall. That's an unfortunate reality. You will encounter people who are just evil. They don't care about other people's well-beings, or maybe they have a personal vendetta against you. And they will bring affliction upon your life, whether it just be somebody you know, a coworker, a boss, whatever it might be. These are things that can bring afflictions in our lives. And sometimes our own decisions will bring afflictions upon ourselves. I've been there, done that many, many times before, and I'm sure the last time I did it won't be the last. We all make mistakes. We all make decisions that just simply aren't within God's will, and it brings afflictions upon our lives. Sometimes there can be a strategy from hell, straight from hell against our lives. Satan is an opportunist. He will look for weak points in our lives. He will look, look for moments of weakness in our minds, in our flesh, in our spirit. And you would, be, you would be fooling yourself if you thought that the devil won't jump on every opportunity he gets to bring affliction upon you. There's a quote from John Trapp that says, the devil loves to fish in troubled waters. You receive bad news. You receive troubling news. You just read something in the news that has nothing to do with you. And it just hurts your heart or whatever it might be. Financial struggles. Relationship struggles. The devil will not pass up an opportunity to deepen the affliction that you're already in. And sometimes we find ourselves in affliction by the sovereign hand of God. God will allow affliction to come upon us, but it is all because of His benevolence and His sovereignty to turn us into the people that He desires us to be, to raise us up as the men and women of God that He desires us to be. You see troubles in scriptures, you know, the, the, um, the disciples on the boat with Jesus in the boat. You know, that was an affliction that came upon them by the sovereign allowance of God. And what did they learn from it? To have faith and trust in Jesus. To turn to Jesus in these troubles. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 16 through 17 says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Afflictions in our lives are oftentimes designed to dethrone God in our heart, to come against who God is in our lives. 
And if God is removed from his place in your heart, afflictions will get the best of you. Hence the word coup. If a coup happens in your heart, it is because you allowed it. The definition of the word coup is a sudden, violent, and illegal seizure of power from a government. On the 28th of June in 2009, the Honduran military followed orders from the Honduran Supreme Court to oust President Manuel Zelaya to send him into exile. Zelaya had attempted to schedule a non-binding poll on holding a constitution, uh, constituent, sorry, constituent assembly to rewrite the constitution. Zelaya refused to comply with the court orders to cease, and the Honduran Supreme Court issued a secret warrant for his arrest dated the 26th of June. Two days later, the Honduran soldiers stormed the president's house in the middle of the night and detained him. Forestalling the poll, instead of bringing him to trial, the army put him on a military airplane and flew him to Costa Rica. Later that day, after reading of the resignation letter of disputed auth authenticity, the Honduran Congress voted to remove Zelaya from office and appointed Speaker of Congress Roberto Michicelli, Mich Micheletti, whatever, sounds Italian to me, his constitutional successor to replace him. Affliction in our lives will quickly and violently try to dethrone God as the king of your life. Finding affliction, I'm sorry, finding comfort in our afflictions is necessary for a strong relationship with Christ. Afflictions in our lives can be very overwhelming. 2 Corinthians 1.9 says, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. What do you do when you feel like you can't do anything? When the circumstances in life around you find you just wondering, how am I going to get out of this? What am I going to do? And oftentimes we seek temporary comfort in carnal pleasures. We just spoke to a man yesterday, actually, hoping he was would been here. I wouldn't be telling the story, but he's t speaking of his troubles in his life, his anxiety, and, and the things he deals with. And anyway, side note, the irony of the sermon I'm preaching today. God has a plan for all of us. We decide if we want to be in it, church. He speaks about the crippling anxiety in his life, the things that he deals with. And we invited him out to the movie night tonight, and he says, I can't go. There's a boxing match I want to watch. And he says, all of my troubles, all my fears, all of the anxiety I deal with disappears when I watch boxing. And me personally, I can relate to that, especially when I was going through the trials of when my dad passed away. I found myself forgetting about the difficulties of life whenever I was playing sports or playing video games. And that was cool, you know, you feel good for a moment, but as soon as the game's over, it all comes right back. These are only temporary. These things don't last. Do we turn to things like this in our lives when we find ourselves in discomfort? Whatever it might be, whether it's a boxing match, video games, sports, drugs, alcohol, relationships, flings, people who just simply aren't a good influence and we know it. You know those people who go to people who they, they just know they're going to hear what they want to hear. Are these the things we're seeking in our afflictions? Are these the things we're seeking in our discomfort? All human comfort, things that we find in this life, are vain and short. They simply don't work long term. And in our scripture, we see that Paul was not at a place where he thought, where he, I'm sorry, he was at a place where he thought he was going to die. Let's read that scripture again, 2 Corinthians 1.9. Indeed, we felt that we had received a sentence of death. He thinks he's going to die. And we, we all know Paul did eventually die for the gospel. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, the message translation of this scripture, I don't oftentimes endorse the message, but every now and then it has something 
uh, some good nuggets in it. And this is what 2 Corinthians 1.9 from the message says. We don't want you in the dark, friends, about how hard it was when all this came, uh, came down on us in Asia province. It was so bad, we didn't think we were going to make it. We felt like we'd been sent to death row, that it is all over for us. As it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. Instead of trusting on our own strength, our wits to get us out of it, we were forced to trust on God totally. And not a bad idea since he's the God who raises the dead. See, the problem we see with many Christians today is that they have allowed the afflictions in their lives to rule their lives. But as Paul says here, even when you feel like you're coming to the point of death, you have to learn to not rely on yourselves, to rely on your own techniques, if you will, to get over these afflictions. But you have to rely completely and entirely on God who raises the dead. If he can raise the dead, he can take care of your affliction. Amen? I mean, it's raising the dead is, is a lot bigger than taking care of, you know, whatever it is <laughs> if, that you got going on. We oftentimes allow our emotions to take over. We allow our emotions in these afflictions to tempt our hearts to run from God, to run from the comfort that comes only from God. And I'm not saying in these moments you won't experience emotions. But what do you do with these emotions? We have to make our decisions. Um, we can't make our decisions based on the emotions we feel in the very moment of our afflictions. We need to learn how to maneuver through the afflictions. Now, I'm not talking about just getting used to living in affliction but learning how to hold on to the expectation of God's blessing during affliction. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You see, Paul, in the same book of 2 Corinthians, is talking about this situation where he feels like he's going to die later on, calls it a light and momentary affliction. Because when we have an eternal mindset of our current afflictions, we can understand that this is simply only a preparing us for the eternal glory that we will experience in heaven. This is simply only preparing us for what God has for us. And the journey in life many times will look like affliction between blessings. You know, it's the, it's the, the old, uh, the, you know, the mountaintops and the valleys, right? Sometimes that's the way it feels. You're at the top, and then the next thing you know, you're crashed right back down to the bottom. Dayton, the, uh, he's a Christian rapper, and one of his songs says, One door closes, another will open, but it's hell in the hallway. And what he's trying to portray here is one door closes, one blessing is over, and another blessing comes, but in the meantime, he's in the hall. He doesn't see where God has him. He doesn't know what's on the other side of that door, but right now it feels like hell. And if you guys know the album that's from, it's a very emotional album. He's going through a very tough time in his life. But the point of it is, is he understands that right now he feels like he's in hell. But he knows that that door that God has open for him will bring blessing. That God will see him through his current afflictions into what he has planned for him on the, on the outside of the hallway. And if you hold on to God's will, going through affliction... There will be blessing at the end. There is no doubt about it. S.H.B. Masterson says this, God often comforts us, not by changing the circumstances of our lives, but by changing our attitudes toward them. Church, God can give you so much blessing within your affliction. If when you're feeling the pain, when you're feeling the pressure, when you're going through it, you turn to God and say, God, what do you have for me in this? What do you have to show me in this affliction? What do you have to show me in this moment of my life? What can I learn from this? Because after all, he is the God of all comfort. So how do you find God in your afflictions? There's three things I'll speak about. Seeking God's character, understanding who God is. 
many Christians don't really even understand who God is. There was, um, I think it was Hawk Nelson, the lead singer of Hawk Nelson. I don't know if you guys know it's a Christian band from back when I was in high school. They kind of stunk. Anyway, <laughs> Christian band, right? Well, it was a couple years ago, I think, he came out and denounced his faith. And he said, I don't see how the God of the Old Testament can be the God of the New Testament. And you read his story about how he's like, you know, talking about basically the affliction of, of the Israelites in the Old Testament versus the compassion of Christ. It didn't make sense, didn't add up to him. And I'm reading it, and the thought that I have in my mind is this man just doesn't understand who God is. He speaks about these trials in the Old Testament, but he doesn't see what God had for them at the end of it. He doesn't see what God had for them in the midst of it, and he obviously didn't see that these people brought most of it upon ourselves, upon themselves. You read the stories of Israel in the desert. They got in a lot of trouble, and they got in a lot of trouble on their own. But yet we see a man who says, I don't understand how God could let them go through that. God gives us free will. God desires us to serve him. These people made their decisions. So whether we're in afflictions or whether we're in blessing, if we understand God's character, it makes it much more simple to see what he has for us through these afflictions. God's character throughout the Bible was not only to comfort his people, but also to protect them. And you see at the end of Israel's time in the desert that they made it through the 40 years and God says, man, you guys think you struggled, but look, your sandals didn't wear out, your clothes didn't get holes in them, and you're not dead. <laughs> they went through a lot of trials that they brought upon themselves, but yet God still had grace and mercy on them and brought them through and gave them provision. Now let's look at Job at the end of his afflictions. You guys know the story of Job. He was a blessed man had a wife, children, riches, all this stuff. He was a, a righteous man. He followed God's word. And Satan attacks him, attacks his family. His wife leaves him. His children die. He loses all of his riches. He gets sick, has boils, finds himself living in the mud. Then his friends come along trying to help him, and instead they just bring him down. But at the end of all of that, God protected Job. Job still had his life, and he still had his faith. God, Job didn't understand what he was going through. Job didn't know why he was going through what he was going through. And probably, till the end of Job's life, he still didn't understand why he was going through what he went through. But we see God restore Job in the book of Job. Chapter 42, verses 10 through 11 says, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then, uh, then came to him all of his brothers and his sisters who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted, comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. Now this isn't to say that when you come out of your afflictions, God's going to make you rich and he's going to fix everything in your life. But the idea here, the symbolism here is that you come out of your afflictions and God has blessing for you. Whether it's monetary blessing or whether it's spiritual blessing or both, he got both. Let's think about the Philippians. Paul writes a letter to the Philippians while they're going through intense persecution. And he says this in Philippians 4 verses 4 through 7, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Think about this. The Philippians are going through persecution. And us here, sitting here in 2021, the most intense persecution we ever had was last year. They said, you guys can't go to church. We came to church. <laughs> this isn't the persecution these, are, these people are going through. The Philippians are going through real persecution. We're talking people being stoned, people being lit on fire, people being cut in half, people being crucified. That is persecution. This is the persecution they're going through, and yet Paul tells them, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. 
Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. He's telling them, you might be facing a stoning. You might get chopped in half. You might get lit on fire. And as you go through these trials, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. We can go through these afflictions. We can go through these hard times in our lives. And in the midst of it, we can look to God and we can say, it's all good. I'll tell you what, I've been there. I've been in these moments where life is tough. But for some reason, I have this peace. And I don't understand it. Like, I seriously, even when you're in the midst of it, you're like, I know this peace is from God, and I know I'm going through this trial. I don't understand why I feel so good. <laughs> it's not like it surpasses other people's understanding. It surpasses our own understanding. We're sitting here in these trials, and we go, life is good. And I don't know why. <laughs> it's, it's, it's remarkable, and it's something that God has for each and every one of us. It's something that the Philippians experienced in real persecution, Church, we don't go through real struggles in America. We just don't. It's true. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. I believe each and every one of us has food on our table at the end of the day. We have roofs over our heads. And nobody's trying to murder us for our faith. At least not yet. Things are getting crazy out there. But right now, things are good. So this is understanding God's character for our lives. Understanding that He has peace for us in affliction. Not that He's, you know hitting us with a stick to try to punish us, but that he's trying to show us something. He's trying to grow us in our pain. The second thing is to up our devotion to Christ, to press in harder to Jesus, to learn to create these times of prayer and studying more regularly. Don't just pray more, but communicate more with God. Don't just read more, but learn more of who God is. Knowing God, understanding who He is through scriptures. God's love is never measured by your comfort, but it is measured by His truth. His truth that is found in the Word of God and relying on God. Trusting, this is the third thing, relying on God, trusting in God's sovereignty. That we would have an unswerving and unchanging faith in God's truth that He has our best interest in our hearts no matter how high the mountain peak and no matter how deep the valley, that we can have trust in God's sovereignty, that He will bring us through whatever we're in, and that He has the best things planned for us. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. Notice that this says, For all who love God, all things work together for good. This doesn't say all things will feel good. It doesn't say all things will seem good. It doesn't say you'll be at the mountain peaks. But it says all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. God has a beautiful way of taking ugly situations and working it together for our good. I've seen it time and time again in my life. And if you've been a Christian who loves God for any amount of time, you've seen it time and time again in your life. It's a simple truth, but it's difficult to see when we're in these trials. When we say, God, I thought you loved me. Why am I going through this? God works these things together for the good of those who love him. We stay true and faithful, unswerving, unchanging faith in what God has for us. And he will work it together for the good of those who love him. You don't always need to know why your problem is your problem. You just have to know God knows why, but he also knows how. There's a quote attributed to an anonymous person. One reason a dog is such a comfort when you're downcast is that he doesn't ask to know why. We don't always have to know why from God. Sometimes we just have to turn to him for comfort and trust him with the why of our circumstances. We find ourselves in situations in life and we go through these things and we come out of them. And we might take it to our grave not knowing why we endured what we endured. But all things work together for the good of those who love God. Our situations can oftentimes affect people around us in ways that we never knew, that we never understand. 
They affected us and protected us in ways that we never knew and never understood. We just have to have faith that when we don't know why, God knows why. And God has a plan through it all. We have to find comfort. I'm sorry, we have to find God in finding comfort. Comfort in afflictions is unique to a relationship with God. You oftentimes live life, you go to work, you have friends, you have family, all these things, these people that you deal with, that you confront, that you do life with, that aren't saved, and you can tell when they're going through it, and you can tell when they're not. Because they don't have comfort in their afflictions. They don't have anything to put their faith in when they go through afflictions. Comfort in afflictions is something only God's people truly have. And I'm not talking about putting on a front, because people can do that people who are going through things and you have no idea and then they end up committing suicide later that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking true and genuine comfort in afflictions when you're going through it and you have faith in god is something only god's people understand something god's people experience you won't find true and lasting comfort in your afflictions if you seek the comfort in the world that is only found in god it is only found in the god of all comfort Can I have every head bowed and every eyes closed?